All right, everybody, we are back here with part two to the every single TV show that I have ever seen tier list here with over 760 different TV shows represented here. If you did not see part one, you can find it in the link pinned below in the description there. But let's jump right back into it here, beginning with Blue's Clues here, another childhood favorite with this one. I'm going to go with good on Blue's Clues here. I mean, Obviously, again, this isn't something that I'm going to seek out nowadays as an adult here by comparison, but I think Blue's Clues was a lot of fun back in the day. Definitely got some childhood nostalgia for this one, um, seeing, of course, Steve and Joe there, uh, the recent uh, sort of uh, little videos that they've done together and uh, seeing them on social media. A lot of fun there to see uh, them reconnect and such. So I'm going to say good tier there. Bart's Abishola. Another one I'm going to say is good here. Um, you know, it tried to be Mike and Molly 2.0, wasn't exactly the same, um, of course, but Billy Gardell is always fantastic in pretty much everything that I've seen him in, so gotta go good tier representing him there. Bob's Burgers here, this one we will definitely put up in the great tier there, I mean, you really can't hate on Bob's Burgers at all, absolutely fantastic show there, Fox sitcom, super iconic, um, I mean, really nothing bad to say about it there, you can get a little repetitive after a while, I think is probably my biggest criticism of it, but uh, other than that, a really, really terrific show. Bojack Horseman here, this might anger some people, I'm gonna go good tier with it, um, you know, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. It's nothing that I think is warranted like this incredibly big, you know, overarching, you know, love and support from every corner online like it seems to get there. I've heard, I've heard some people call it the best TV show of all time, you know, and that's fine if you think that way. I think it maybe is a little bit overrated, but I can totally see why this show has such a big fan base behind it. It has a lot more dramatic elements compared to a typical you know, a uh, sitcom in, the, in like, uh, or an, an animated sitcom in that regard. It's definitely a tragedy, first and foremost there, which is appealing to some people, I think, that want something a little more different than what your typical sitcom would offer. But for me, you know, it, it should make you laugh, first and foremost. And I just don't get a lot of that out of BoJack Horseman, but I do respect it. So I'll say good tier there. Boom here. This was a dumb show, man. <laughs> this is such a dumb show. I'm going to put it in that tier. Um... If you're not familiar, very, very short-lived, uh, you know, one season wonder here um, from Fox back in the day. And the gimmick was they'd have these, what were, you know, bombs. They were, you know, shaped and, and made to look like bombs, but they were obviously just props there. Um, and it was a trivia show where you had to answer questions by cutting the answers correspondingly by color to the bomb and if you picked the wrong one, it would explode. And that's how you know you lost the round. And it was typically in the format of which of these things doesn't belong with the rest of this group. So, for example, if it was like, you know, what were the lead characters on the show Friends, right? And it would be Ross and Rachel and Joey and Chandler. And then there would be, you know, an extra one there and it would be like Nick or something, you know, is never a lead character. And so if they cut that one, then it would explode. And that was the gimmick of it, was seeing the explosions. And it was always the most, like, weird, random, grossest, you know, shit that they could come up with. It'd be, like, guacamole or egg salad or spaghetti sauce. I mean, it was just, like, the weirdest shit. It was always a food item. It was just so nasty. So, I don't know. Really, really dumb, really cheesy show. Uh, no pun intended there. Um, I'm going to sing that here. Border Town, uh, I think underrated. I think underrated, definitely short-lived as well from Fox there, executively produced by some of the guys over at Family Guy. Um, had that very similar style of humor to it, but um, I don't know why everyone rags on it. I always really liked Border Town, so I'm gonna give it a good tier. Brain Search here, uh, another childhood favorite. I'll go good tier as well with this one, uh, Nickelodeon Game Show. The craziest thing about this, uh, I don't even know how many people know this, but the majority of the show now, I'd say like at least like two thirds of it is considered lost media. Like it has never been archived. It's never been saved. It's never been put on streaming or anything. No home media releases. It is just gone, which is insane to think because they re-ran the show 
all the time when I was growing up, um, all throughout the 2010s, and now it's just missing. So there's about a third of it left out there. Um, of course, a community trying to find it, but it's just wild to think, you know, what was what's so benign or what's so commonplace nowadays might be gone tomorrow. You know, you never know. So kind of crazy to think, but yeah, overall, pretty solid show. Brand new cherry flavor. Oh dear, oh dear. All right, it's going in bed here. TikTok already knows why. If you would like to know why it's going in bad tier, episode four, 35 minutes in, proceed at your own warning. That's all I'm gonna say. AVGN, uh, much better. <laughs> that uh, than whatever Netflix is trying to do there. Um, this is going to climb up the ladder all the way to the God tier. I mean, not just for me, like as far as my favorites go, as far as just being as big and as grandiose and as influential and impactful as it's been. I mean, it's arguably the most influential show on this entire list, if not for James Wolfe and this series. The internet and YouTube culture and gaming culture and criticism would not exist the way it is now. I mean, we talked about like all that, for example, how it branched out and it affected all these different things. I mean, AVGN doesn't create, um, or James Rolf rather doesn't create AVGN. That doesn't lead to the rise of Let's Plays. That doesn't lead to the rise of Twitch. That doesn't lead to the rise of streaming. That doesn't lead to the rise of anything modern now that exists within the YouTube or internet or gaming space online. And it's just wild to think like how much of it you can trace back to James and the show and this character. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that I love and that I've been influenced by directly, ABGN a little bit too, um, you know, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now if not for ABGN. So it's just wild to think in the timeline where this doesn't exist, what the internet looks like, you know? Um, but yeah, absolutely God tier for sure. Following that, another one that, you know, another show that obviously has a lot of ties as far as its influence and its impact goes, we got the GOAT itself, Breaking Bad here. I mean, listen, you can call this show overrated. You can call it bad. You can just flat out say it sucks, but you cannot deny its influence. You cannot deny its impact. It's definitely got to go God tier, even if it's not my favorite personally. Like, it, that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? That does not matter. This is a God-tier show in every capacity here. I mean, Brian Cranston, absolutely wonderful. Um, I mean, obviously has the spinoff with Better Call Saul's we talked about earlier, which I think is also phenomenal. I mean, there's just so many little details about this show and so many little elements to it that has just come together to form this very, uh, you know, intelligent, mature grandiose story uh, with all these little, you know, subliminal things that contribute to the story arc and that just build up and build up to this insane conclusion that you have no idea, you know, you never see coming there. Obviously one of the best finales of all time as well. Um, just a masterclass in execution from start to finish there and so well how all of these actors and all of these people coming together to make something that they actually feel passionate about. That's the one thing with Breaking Bad that you don't really see with too many other shows, admittedly. You know, a lot of people just see it as a job. You know, they just see it as a paycheck, right? They don't really have that that passion for it or that, you know, they, they, they don't get that sense of, uh, of satisfaction when uh, doing what they do with these. But you never felt that with Breaking Bad. You always felt like everybody as part of that cast and crew wanted to be there. They wanted to put this story forward. That's exactly what they did. And, you know, 15 years later, man, we are talking about it as one of the greatest shows of all time. So that's what you get there. Um, but yeah, absolutely got to here for sure. Brickleberry here, uh, another adult cartoon that I think is pretty solid here that um, is definitely more like Mike and Matt Speed. They're definitely more familiar with it than I am, but um, it's a pretty solid show from what I've seen. Uh, Daniel Tosh, of course, from Tosh.0 on uh, Comedy Central there and Comedy Central hosted uh, and aired Brickleberry. So any connections there obviously make a lot of sense, but yeah, overall solid show. Broke here, um, not to be confused with the 2016 series Broke with Quinta Brunson, but Broke with um, the chick from NCIS. I forget her name at the moment, but 
Um, I'm gonna say this is pretty meh, honestly. Um, I didn't even really like, I wasn't even consciously thinking about it when I was making this list because um, I didn't mention this before, but this took me like a month to put this all together because um, for one, like putting all the pictures and stuff on the maker, on the tier list maker here, but also the um, just, you know, prepping how many different shows I've seen because 700, you know, it's a lot to keep track of. But when I was going through this one, I was like, I got to 2020, you know, and the more relevant stuff. I was going through the list of shows that came out there and like broke. Have I seen this? It sounds familiar. And I like vaguely remember watching bits and pieces of this over quarantine because that's when it came out. And this like came out right at the beginning of it too. So not exactly the best uh, representation of like, you're gonna remember this show and you're gonna remember being just like in the worst moment in you know, modern day history, right? Uh, over COVID and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, pretty forgettable, pretty just uneventful show. Uh, doesn't really do much for me. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, on the other hand, does quite a bit. In fact, I'm gonna throw this one up at the A1 tier there. I think it's one of Michael Shore's best. I think it's one of Fox's best, one of Andy Sandberg's best. I mean, again, every single category, every single person that's involved with this, you can put it high up on their list there. Uh, phenomenal show, phenomenal. Uh, Bucket and Skinner's, <laughs> excellent adventures. So remember what I said last time about uh, the 2000s, you know, Nickelodeon era and, um, you know, Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, any of those kids era shows um, that we always want to prop up and say are the best of all time and are elite and stuff. We often forget that we also had Bucket and Skinner's Excellent Adventures <laughs> as part of our lineup. And that wasn't something that came out later that we can blame on Generation Z and the Henry Danger Watchers, no, 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 that falls victim on us. And um, yeah, that's pretty embarrassing because, um, man, if you've seen this show, you know, Nickelodeon had a lot of hits behind them, but man, did they fucking fumble this one, man. This is just embarrassing. What a terrible representation of our generation, man. What a terrible show. It's absolutely awful. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, now that show is not terrible. That's a great show. Um, actually, you know what? Borderline A1 tier. I'm going to throw it up in A1. I really want to see more of it for sure. Love the cast on it. Love that opening episode. Just has so much energy to it, so much action to it. Um, I mean, again, I've been preaching. I'm not really a sci-fi uh, fantasy type guy, but when it hits, man, it hits so fucking good. And Buffy is a great representation of that bowl with Michael Weatherly here, uh, CBS drama, of course. I'm going to put it in the good tier. Um, I followed it pretty closely for the first couple of seasons. This is another one that's similar to Blind Spot, and like this was around the time where I was watching a lot of shows like this, like these dramas that were a little more high profile than what I was watching uh, routinely at the time. And I followed this for the first, you know, maybe season and a half to two. And then once I started working in school, you know, in my last couple of years of high school, and then I just got overwhelmed with all that and I didn't have time for TV. So I never went back and followed through on this one either. But from what I remember, it was pretty solid. Um, I mean, Michael Weatherly, he did a good job here as the lead role. It's based on Dr. Phil and sort of his time um, before his talk show career, of course, when he was like a lawyer and um, kind of like a psychologist as far as like picking out juries and jury selection. That's kind of what he did. That's what the show explores, at least in the first season, from what I remember. So, um, you know, interesting enough premise and, and good enough execution, I think. Maybe not the most memorable, you know, not something they have to see. But um, if that sounds interesting to you, you know, I'd say give it a shot. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. We are going. This is going to be a dark time. These next three, I can already tell you. <laughs> Looking forward to it. This is going to be a dark era of the tier list here because these next three, you know, we'll just knock them all out together. We have Caillou. We have Call Me Cat and we have Candy Crush there. Oh my God, the triple C of confusion and just catastrophe here. What a terrible selection of shows. I mean, Caillou is pretty self-explanatory. I don't need to be the millionth and one person to tell you how bad Caillou is, man. Uh, what a spoiled fucking brat. Fuck that dick. Get him out of here. You lucky ass cancer or maybe alopecia now. I don't fucking know. Um, Call Me Cat here. I mean... Dude, just watch Miranda. I've been saying that for so long. Just watch Miranda, man. If you want to see this show done well, 
just watch Miranda. Come on, guys. And then Candy Crush here. So another thing that I did just for fun, well, for some of these shows, not every single one, but, um, you know, I went to Rotten Tomatoes, went to IMDb, just to get a sense of what other people feel about some of these shows, especially the ones that, like, are a little more obscure, or ones that, you know, I hadn't seen in so long from my childhood. And one of them was Candy Crush, because this is a pretty forgotten game show from back in the day with... Uh, Mario Lopez here is the host based on the game Candy Crush and apparently on IMDb at the time that I saw it it was at a 2.3 out of 10 which was the lowest I'd ever seen up into that point but it's not the lowest that I have seen since then because there's one show that I know for sure that I haven't that it's not on this list but the lowest show in IMDb history with a 1 out of 10. If you know what it is, leave it in the comments. I'd like to see how many people can guess. But anyways, Candy Crush there, yeah, absolutely terrible. Um, I mean, Mario Lopez is nothing for this show. This is like network execs, like, you know, 65-year-old men, <laughs> boomer level, like, so out of touch. You know, this is like the poster child representing of what that is like, so absolutely awful show so yeah those that trio of them just get out of here please uh can't hurry love on the other hand we'll keep this one we like can't hurry love that's a good show uh, i'm gonna go good tier with or uh, great tier rather with it um i mean mershka hargate of course from svu there um very very different as far as the style that she's bringing to the show and the vibe that she's bringing on um, very much like similar to like uh friends or will and grace or you know, uh, How I Met Your Mother, of course, any of those types of shows that we've been down this road with a billion times over. For me, the thing that's interesting, though, about it is, like, it came out in 95, so the only representation it had that was similar up until that point was Friends, but even then, Friends was still in its infancy. It wasn't a cultural juggernaut like it is now, so this was still kind of on the cutting edge of it as far as, like, this idea of all these single people living in New York, you know, just navigating their way through adulthood, that wasn't as big of a trope as it was nowadays. So looking at it from the top for like for its time, I mean, this is a pretty revolutionary show to some degree. It definitely didn't have the same impact as Friends, uh, given its its legacy and such. But, um, you know, it, it, the cult fan base that it has surrounding it, myself included, uh, it doesn't look that unjust given... Uh, it's, you know, humble beginnings there. So uh, I'll say great tier for sure. Next up, Capital Critters here. Been down this road a million times before. It's just whatever. Card Sharks. Um, I'll say good tier, I guess. It's okay. Uh, a lot of these classic game shows um, are on Buzzer, which is a like kind of syndicated network that airs uh, just these old school game shows from like the 70s and 80s, and they play Card Sharks quite a bit. And for some reason, I don't know why, but... Every day when I go to work, uh, we have a TV in our break room, and a lot of the people that I work with just happen to be old, and they like game shows. So Buzzer is usually on, and it's either Card Sharks or Match Game is usually what they're playing at the times that I work, at least. And so I've seen quite a bit of Card Sharks, and, you know, it's fine. It's a fine show. Nothing wrong with it, but it's not something I'm seeking out anytime soon. Cash Cab is kind of another one in that boat. Um, I'll just say good tier. It's okay. It's all right. It's a little more gimmicky because it's like getting into a cab and now I'm on TV all of a sudden, you know. Hey, there's worse cabs to get into. There's worse taxis to get into. If you know, you know. But um, yeah, for some reason it was on the Discovery Channel too, which is like so random of an anecdote because it doesn't match at all. But um, you know, it's an okay show. That's all right. Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that. Um, it's between good and great, but I'll put it in good tier. Um, because at the time, like, we watched this all the time growing up, me and Matt. I think because of how much we saw it, like, the, just, you know, how often it was on, I got a little sick of it back in the day. But looking back in retrospect, it's probably a little bit better than I'm giving it credit for. Because it was really just, like, vibrant and it had a lot of, you know, character to it. It had a lot of personality behind it. Martin Short, of course, as the title character there, really brought a really nice uh, depth of personality and was really, you know, lively with the show, which is always good to see. But I think, like, again, like I said, like, just 
how repetitive as far as like how often we saw it. I mean, this is like a daily show that we watch. It just got a little bit stale after a while. So it's hard for me to go back and really give it as much props as I can because I just got kind of bored of it after a while. Catch 21, um, just kind of another middle of the road game show hosted by Carlton there, <laughs> Alfonso Romero. Um, you know, it's okay. It's all right. It's just basic trivia. And then um, the bonus round is like, you got to get blackjack, right? So you got to match 21, um, but it's okay. Celebrity Name Game, a uh, syndicated game show with uh, Craig Ferguson here as the host. I'm going to say Matt here. Um, I don't, like, it's basically just like a word association is all it is, but um, they just have celebrities, you know, it's like playing along with the contestants. It's just very, I don't even know how to describe this. It's like the most, like, like by the book, like simplest idea for a show ever. Like there's no creativity to it. There's nothing unique about it whatsoever. It is just the most middle of the road average show that you could possibly come up with. So, uh, the mat tier was made for a show like this. Like if there's anybody anywhere else, it would, it would feel unjust. Uh, Central Park here. I like Central Park, um, probably more than most. I'll put it in a great tier, but it's weird because, like, this is the kind of show that I feel like is kind of the tipping point for, like, Lauren Burchard and the rest of the Bob's Burgers team because they're doing this, and then they're doing, obviously, Bob's Burgers, The Great North, and, Cent and um, uh, what's the other one? House Broken, I think, is under them. So they have a lot of shows under their, uh, on their plate right now. And this feels like the black sheep of them all. You know what I mean? Like, this is, like they're really ambitious with this you know, they're going to apple with this one as opposed to fox and it's it's a, you know it got the musical numbers in it it's got this really big cast with a lot of big names in it but like they're really pushing the envelope with this one and it just feels like they're a little bit out of their element here like they need to stick with like the more simple you know like bob's burgers-esque you know almost like toilet humor type of stuff every now and again as this show is is you know pretty good but it, it does feel like a little bit, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit out of its depth is like the best way I can describe it. So there's Central Park for you. Uh, Larry Sanders show. This is a great show, man. What an underrated show for sure. Um, as far as HBO is concerned, I mean, Gary Shandling, absolutely hilarious on this one uh, i've never seen his self-titled show that he did for showtime but uh for sure this one on hbo like i said absolutely fantastic um hosting a fictional late night talk show that's gonna give you hijinks for sure great one chain reaction i really like chain reaction um i'm gonna put this in the great tier actually uh another word association game but it has a little bit more character behind it um it was cool when they did the revival you got the same guy that hosted it back in the day and was on it um, and this is like super trivial and like super obscure, this next anecdote I have. So, um, yeah, but I, I find it funny. So if anyone out there is familiar with Adam Ragusea here on YouTube, he's a great chef. He does cooking videos here and food related videos. Super, super great here on YouTube. Um, I have a, there's a subreddit that I follow with him and it, you know, talks about his videos and such, but someone a couple weeks ago found an old episode of Chain Reaction where his wife Lauren was a contestant, which is like so random and so crazy connecting those two. Cause I'm like, this is Chain Reaction. This is from like 2006. What, what is she doing on here? That's crazy. Um, but yeah, that was a pretty cool anecdote I found. So yeah, I, I really like this show. It's gonna go in great tier for sure. Uh, Internet historian, man. Man, what a legendary YouTuber for sure. Great show. Um, I'm going to throw this one all the way up in the A1 tier. I mean, super like all about the memes and super all about like the gimmicks and the goofiness of it all, but in the best way possible, right? I mean, it has like these really elaborate stories and these really elaborate um, sort of like the ways that he presents the information are just super out there and super whimsical. And that's what makes it so interesting to see because a, a story about like, you know, what's a, what's a good example, like Y2K or something or like uh, Firefest or something like that's not really that interesting of a story, but the way that he um, presents it and makes it like super over the top and stuff is, is just hilarious. So really something that like, 
you know, can't really be described. It's like, you have to see it for yourself to really understand what, you know, the vibe is there, but uh, really, really good stuff. Chappelle's show. Um, I mean, who doesn't love Dave Chappelle? Come on, come on. We gotta go at least great tier with him. Uh, legendary stand-up, of course. Another sketch comedy show that, you know, definitely had a fair share of just kind of whatever mediocre sketches, but man, when it hit, it hit for sure. Dave Chappelle, um, probably best known actually like post Chappelle show of just kind of not being in the spotlight as much and just kind of being a little more reserved, you know, um, only coming out when, you know, he really wanted to do it. Like he had a real passion for it. He's hosted SNL a billion times since then. <laughs> it always kills on SNL. Um, but that's just really like, you know, again, when he feels the need to, it's not cause he's doing it for money or, you know, for fame or anything. He just, he just enjoys doing it. So I have a lot of respect for that. Cheers here. Uh, another one we got to go in the great tier four. I mean, again, Ted Danson here, absolutely wonderful there. Um, easily one of the most popular sitcoms of not just its time, but you know, the legacy that it holds. I've seen Lisp calling it the best sitcom of all time, even over like the Simpsons or um, I Love Lucy or, or Seinfeld or anything like that. Uh, they put cheers above it. And I think that's justified because it's a great show. Chef at Home here. Um, this is definitely going to be more niche. Like I'm not expecting anyone to put this as high as I am. Um, this is definitely a very obscure cooking show. It's from Canada and it was syndicated here on Ion Life uh, here in the States for a few years. But I love it, man. I mean, Michael Smith is so goofy as a host and he's just so dumb sometimes, like the way that he presents everything. Um, but it has this very like rustic like homegrown feel to it like he's not doing anything like super fancy he's just he's cooking for his family you know he's not like entertaining these celebrities or anything um and it just has this very like presented you know in, in like the most organic way possible which is really nice um the one thing that's like kind of weird about it is some of the camera work like i don't know why the cinematography is the way it is that's like the one thing that you kind of have to just get past when you start watching the show is like the camera is like very different compared to most cooking shows but um for your typical stand and stir it's so much more like just natural and genuine feeling than most shows so i really like that about it on a one tier for sure cherry's wild dumb dumb game show um drew good made a whole video about this you can watch his video he does a great job explaining it i like jason biggs just fine but just such a dumb idea for a show like so stupid you know it's just gambling it's just gambling it's just luck more or less there's no skill involved so that's what like kills it for me because a good game show should not only be fun for the contestants to watch but should also be fun for the um players and you know playing at home right and playing along with it and that's what a good game show is able to do like family feud we'll talk about later is my favorite game show period and that's what makes it so good. And what puts it at the top is that element that it balances those two extremes because it's great to watch and play along with, but the, for the contestants, it's fun as well. But here, there's no skill involved at all. It's pure luck. And there's nothing for the audience to attach themselves to and to, to really get in the swing of things alongside the people because it's just a it's just a slot machine. <laughs> That's all it is. So it just completely fails on all levels as far as being good TV and a good game show. So get out of here. All right, next up here, we have the trio of Chicago shows. You guys know me. Love me the Chicago shows here, beginning with Fire here. They're all going to get a different tier, surprisingly. So Fire is going to go A1. Med is going to go in the great tier. And man, we got a lot of shows piling up there. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be interesting to see because after a while, it's going to be hard to maneuver all these up there. Um, and then for PD, of course, we got to go top tier here, God tier as my favorite show. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these because, you know, I've talked about endlessly and pretty much every other video that's TV based mentioned at least one of these before. Um, but yeah, they just get progressively better throughout the night. I don't know if it's structured that way purposefully because that's just my opinion on it. For most people, I, I think they say uh, fire is the best, but for me, it just keeps it engaging because you want to see PD because you know it's going to be the most reliable at the end, so it keeps you engaged the whole way through. 
Um, again, that great you know structure on the schedule there. We've talked about that before. NBC just absolutely uh, killed it with this one and absolutely stunning ratings that it puts up every single night, man. Absolutely monstrous numbers. So uh, thumbs up to the Chicago's for sure. Child's Play here. Another classic game show. Um, I'll put it in a bet here. Yeah, it doesn't really have that much going for it. Um, it's a word association where kids describe a word to the contestants and they have to figure out what it is based on their description of it. And I don't know, it's just, it sounds like an all right idea, but this is like so 70s. Like, <laughs> it's just so like dated and cheesy. So yeah, it's kind of dumb. Child Support, uh, another game show. There's been a lot of these over the years, like a lot of reboots of this show. None of them have been that interesting. Um, honestly, the one with Fred Savage is the, is the most like up-to-date modern one. Even then, it's just kind of whatever. So um, just never has done anything for me. So I'm you know, going bad tier. Chopped tier, absolutely love Chopped. A1 tier for sure. Um, I mean, at its peak, Chopped was arguably the best cooking show on TV because it, it bridged the gap. It was like really mainstream for a while. And people that didn't even watch reality TV or cooking shows found their way to Chopped, you know what I mean? It just had, it was such a simple concept too, which was perfect for the reality show boom of the 2000s. It came in just at the tail end of that in 2009. Um, but, you know, talented chefs, um, a decent prize, 10 grand at the end of it all. Um, you had a reliable cast of judges that would come in and rotate through. So if you're a fan of them, you know, you know all the classic judges, Scott, Amanda, Jeffrey, um, Manit, you know, and then of course the uh, host himself, Ted Allen, always very funny as well there. Um, but, you know, the, the, form, the formula could be argued as repetitive, but because, you know, there's so many variables that change each episode, like the judges rotate and the ingredients rotate, there's enough variety in each one to keep it a little more refreshing each time. Um, and it's been on for 50 seasons. So they're doing something right there. They obviously do like four cycles a year to get to that number. But yeah, um, Chopped is awesome. Chopped is great. Next up, you know what's bullshit that not enough people know you know what's bullshit? Because it's a fantastic show. It's going A1 tier. Um, it's another show off of Cinemassacre. So the ABGN crowd um, is very much familiar with this one. Uh, James Rolfe, again, creator and star of this one. Um, just very simple, like, little rants about the most everyday annoyances, you know, which is so funny because it's such a simple concept, but, again, executed the highest degree. So definitely A1 tier for me. Clarence here. Um, I don't know why so many people rag on Clarence. Um, again, like, it's it's one of those Cartoon Network shows I think is fantastic. I It's borderline A1 tier, honestly, but um, I'll reserve it. I'll put it at great tier because I kind of, you know, understand maybe because the slice of life thing isn't definitely for everybody. There's definitely some arguments that slice of life is just really repetitive and really dumb. And, you know, I've kind of fallen um, on side of those sometimes. Like Curb Your Enthusiasm is a show that very much follows that sort of structure that is just not for me. But I mean, Seinfeld as well. Like who doesn't love Seinfeld? So I don't know, maybe a little hit or miss for some people, but I think it's fantastic. I'm going to put it in a great term. Next up is Clone High here. Another one like you got to represent High. Um, I'll go great tier with it. I haven't seen as much of it as some other people. I've only seen a few episodes, so can't put it too high up. But um, yeah, fantastic show for sure. Um, if it does get a revival, because there has been some talk about reviving it and stuff, um, I'd be willing to watch it. But I don't know how much of that would like, how, you know, how well it would translate to a revival, because it seems like a show that was almost destined to end up the way it was, you know, is like, it started off very ahead of its time, and then, you know, aired, and it was kind of forgotten about, and then it got this huge boost, you know, because of the internet, and, um, you know, them finding these forgotten gems from back in the day, and doing a revival of it just seems like it would kind of undermine the legacy of it in some way that it had this like very organic prog progression um where it was you know forgotten about and then picked up through like a really genuine fan base and then that would seem like they they're just kind of like i don't know you know what i mean like <laughs> it, it's kind of hard to describe but it just feels like it would kind of undermine 
um, some of that genuine, you know, organic uh, love that people have for it. So, uh, but to me, it's definitely a great tier show. Come to Papa, um, <laughs> Tom Papa, of course. I'm gonna put it in the good tier. Uh, not as bad as everyone says, but um, you know, not really something that needs to be archived. You know, it was lost media for a very long time, understandably so, because it was a short-lived forgotten sitcom from 2004. So, you know, not a lot of people really archiving stuff like that. But, um, you know, I think it's a decent show. Community, ooh, this is going to piss some people off. Okay, I won't put it in bad tier. I'll put it in bad tier. You know, I'll compromise there. It's really just not something for me. I just, I'm just not a fan of it personally. Um, it's a little too meta. It's a little too over the top at times. You know, Dan Harmon, that's kind of what you get. I've just never really clicked with anything that he's done. So um, it's not really the show. It's just more his style with it. I like the cast on it. I still, it's just so weird to me that John Oliver's on it. Like I just, it's so fucking weird to see his career transition. Like going from that to last week tonight is just insane to me. Um, but yeah, community is just, you know, it's whatever to me. I know a lot of people love it and that's fine, but it's just not really my cup of tea. One that I think everyone can agree on though is absolute garbage is connecting here. Even if you've never seen it, oh my God, what a horrible, horrible idea for a show. This came out right at the height of COVID and the whole idea is people are in quarantine and they are talking over Skype. That's every episode or Zoom, I guess it was. But um, yeah, they're talking over Zoom and it's just a group of friends and it's and it has like that sort of element where it wants to be, again, like Will and Grace and friends and How I Met Your Mother, uh, you know, a bunch of 20 something year olds trying to figure out their life, but with quarantine as the backdrop. And it's just so incredibly insensitive. Like, I mean, making, building a whole show around this during quarantine in real life when people are trying to think about anything but the situation they're in and then they turn this on and they see a tv show centered around just that is just incredibly disheartening i mean that is just insane to think that this was ever going to be a success and um it showed because nbc pulled this after five episodes because naturally nobody fucking wanted it and then what's even crazier is most of the time they can offset it to a cable network or they can put it on Peacock or something. They can let it ride out there. They didn't even bother to show the rest of the episodes on Peacock. I mean, that's how low it is when you can't even get Peacock to agree with you on the show. That's how you know you fucked up because, I mean, no offense to Peacock. I love NBC and it's, you know, a pretty solid streaming service, but they don't have that high of a bar for these shows when they refuse to show it. That's when you know you did very, very bad with what you were supposed to do. Um, and connecting, man, just what an infamous show. This is going to be the kind of show that, like, like nobody's going to forget or, you know, everyone's going to, you know, forget about it. And then, like, 10 years from now, we're going to see a huge video essay on it on YouTube or something that's going to float around. It's going to be, like, that time that NBC wanted to make a quarantine show during quarantine. It's like, yeah, remember when that happened? No, but I do. And you can mark this video as a landmark in that because I think I'm the only person to ever talk about it on YouTube in that way. So there you go. Uh, Crook's Country, the spinoff to America's Test Kitchen. It's going in the same tier as ATK, so good tier. It's basically the same idea, but um, instead of it being like, you know, in a more kind of professional, you know, kitchen environment, it's a little more down home. It's a little more rustic. It's got that like country, you know, sort of element to it. Um, they're up in like the upstate like New York or like Vermont or something up there kind of in the in the woodsy area so um, that aesthetic to it I think is a little bit better because of the type of food that they make it kind of matches with that a little bit um, yeah it, it, more chemistry in that regard but um, yeah it's essentially the same show as America's Test Kitchen. Cosmos uh, on Fox here hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson. I remember when this show came out and I was like, I was pretty excited by it because I was like, ooh, this is a space show, you know, and it's got the science show and it's going to be, you know, very educational and informative. And then I just remember watching it and thinking like, this is like the most basic shit. Like, why are they telling me the planets? You know what I mean? Like they're introducing me to all these planets. I'm like, I know that give me just something better you know what i mean so a remake of um the original with carl sagan of course which is not on here i've never seen it 
but um, a lot of people love it. A lot of people think it's, you know, amazing show. It has a huge rate on IMDb, but for me, it's just very middle of the road. It's just like the most basic kind of surface level stuff about space and science. So I don't know, better documentaries out there if you want that. Criminal Minds here. I'm gonna say good tier with Criminal Minds. Um, I mean, it has a legacy behind it, of course. It has the um, just incredible, you know, uh, impact as far as like what it did for CBS, of course, and kind of uh, really uh, harpening into their um, police procedurals and such, and it has all the spinoffs and whatnot. Shamir Moore, of course, is a huge name for them. So it did a lot of good in that regard. Um, as far as the show itself, though, it's kind of just a by the numbers crime drama at the end of the day. So you guys know how I feel about crime dramas. They're, they're pretty, you know, hit or miss for me. So um, it just is what it is there. CSI Miami. Uh, maybe some people are going to be upset by this. I've never really been that big on CSI. I mean, I want to support it because it's just a huge franchise, of course. But Miami is like the example of like the best one for most people. It's like the, you know, like if you want to get into CSI, start with this one is what most people would argue. And I just do not like David Caruso. I just do not like David Caruso at all. You know what I mean? Um, that's the problem with this show is just can't get past the lead. You know, if you don't like the lead actor, then what's the point? So for me, that's just kind of my takeaway from it. But yeah, I'm going that here. Cupcake Wars. It's stupid. It's dumb, but you know, it can be kind of funny at times, but more or less, it's just kind of like, it's a baking show, you know? I mean, it's been extremely popular for, um, uh, for Food Network. Of course, I, I, I think, I could be wrong, but I think Two Bro Girls kind of gave it a boost in popularity because there was a whole um, episode centered around them going on Cupcake Wars, which if you know Two Bro Girls, makes a ton of sense. Um, but I remember like hearing about that, that they did that on Two Bro Girls and then like that like translated to more people checking the show out, which is again, so weird, like how TV as a whole can do that sometimes, you know, that the medium of TV is absolutely wild in that regard because you find so many weird connections like that. And then you see like, oh, this led to this being very popular. This led it to being extremely bad, you know, and like the, the, the roads and the ties that they have with one another like that. So I don't know, but uh, a couple of wars overall, just kind of whatever. Uh, same with Curb Your Enthusiasm, as I kind of briefly mentioned in passing earlier, I think Curb is just kind of okay. It's pretty overrated, honestly. Just watch Seinfeld, you know, <laughs> that's what I would do. Curious George. Finally, a kid show that I have nostalgia for and I can watch as an adult without feeling weird about it because, man, Curious George, arguably the best childhood show on this entire list there. I mean, of course, there's the big, big fish, no pun intended, that we will talk about later. But for PBS kids especially, I mean, Curious George was top tier, my friend, absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's great because, like... You know, I watched a lot of it with my parents, obviously growing up, and they watched a ton of PBS Kids and Nickelodeon stuff. And my dad and my mom love Curious George just as much as me and Matt do. I mean, that was a show that like we all could collectively watch no matter what um, you know age me and Matt were at the time. Uh, we all found something to like about it. So uh, very, very universal in that regard. Cutthroat Kitchen, uh, another one that's super gimmicky, but it was a lot of fun. I'm gonna put it in great tier. Um, not as good as Chopped in that regard. It was weird because, like, it was all about the, um, you know, thematics of it. It was never about the food, which is funny because for a cooking show, that is, like, the objective goal with any cooking show is to be, like, the food should be front and center. But with Cutthroat Kitchen, it was like, <laughs> what would it be like if they made chicken parmesan with golf clubs? <laughs> You know what I mean? That's what they do and stuff. And the contestants bidding on these sabotages, as they called them, and then, uh, you know, placing them on different chefs. I mean, there was, like, some camaraderie there that was really, really fun and really electric in each episode. So um, even though I actually cannot stand Alton Brown, I, I fucking hate Alton Brown. Uh, I used to love him, but I just I can't stand him anymore for reasons I'll talk about later. But, um, yeah, I mean, Cutthroat Kitchen was really really good back in its day and I'm still kind of pissed that they let it go because why beat Bobby Flay and 
Guys Grocery Games. I mean, Guys Grocery Games is okay, but like for the other competition shows they had, why not Cutthroat Kitchen, man? I thought that was a blast. So I guess not enough people watched it or something, but yeah, I always enjoyed it. Uh, Cyber Chase here. Cyber Chase is pretty nostalgic for me. Um, it's not as big for me as it is for Matt. I mean, Matt absolutely loves Cyber Chase, but I'll put it in good tier. Um, rest in peace, Gilbert Godfrey, man. Another recent loss we've had, man. So many big TV icons from just 2022 alone, just from these first few months. Um, absolutely tragic. So, but yeah, he was great on the show and the just whole aesthetic of it, um, kind of talking about math and science and kind of has that futuristic, you know, atmosphere to it. I thought it was really cool watching as a kid. So all things, you know, told, I'll put it in good tier. Dancing with the Stars, it's never been for me. Um, some of my aunts absolutely love it, but that is the kind of audience they're going for. Again, it's not really someone like me. The big thing with Dancing with the Stars though now is, I don't know if I've talked about this previously. I might have in a previous video, but um, the 2022 to 2023 uh, TV schedule is going to be historic and that it'll be the first time since 2005 that Dance with the Stars is not present on there because ABC is pulling it. They're putting it on Disney Plus going forward, which is insane because it has been like a cornerstone show for them for almost two decades now. Um, and even though it hasn't been the most reliable in ratings, at least for the past few years, it was still very much had, you know, that cult fan base that would watch it all the time, the same way that Idol does now, even though it's not as big as it once was. Um, but yeah, that's, that's crazy because I don't think Disney plus has really the right demo for a show like this. So we'll have to see, you know, kind of the results of that and if that was a good decision or not on their behalf, but, um, that's still, that's, that's absolutely wild. So but obviously for me, either way, you know, it's not really a show that I'd be watching because I just don't care about that kind of stuff. So, uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood here. I don't know how much of an unpopular opinion this is, but I fucking hate this show. I cannot stand this show at all. Like, I don't think it really is because it's it seems pretty trivial in the grand scheme of things because it's PBS and stuff. But I fucking despise this show just watch Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. Just fucking watch Mr. Rogers Neighborhood instead. Why are you watching this? This is so dumb, dude. It's <laughs> so stupid. Because it tries to be Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, but it's just like a, you know, cartoon version of that with a fucking tiger named Daniel for some reason. I just, I fucking hate it. I hate every single aspect of this show. Get the fuck out of here. Go bye-bye. Danny Phantom, on the other hand, now that's a good cartoon. That's a good cartoon. I'll say good tier. Um, I didn't watch it as much as like SpongeBob, obviously, or something, but this is definitely one that I had in pretty constant rotation on Nickelodeon there. Um, just a really fun atmosphere to watch. Good action, obviously, on the show. So all, all told, solid show. Uh, Daredevil here, same thing uh, for pretty much the same reason. I mean, good action there. Obviously, much more sure with Daredevil there. Um, I just... For Marvel stuff, for like superhero stuff, I'm just not really that tapped into that community or that, you know, fan base at all. So it's probably much higher for most people given its scores online. But um, for me, you know, I think it's a solid enough show if that's what you're looking for. But it just doesn't really appeal to someone with my sensibilities. Daria here um, as well. I think I'm going to go good tier here. Um, definitely not as good as Beavis and Butthead, of course, the spinoff of it. But um, Daria as a character is very relatable, at least. Um, definitely has that, like, cynical, you know, pessimistic type of attitude about the world, but um, very, very relatable as far as, like, that coming-of-age story and, you know, teenage years and such, just kind of seeing the world as a through a different lens and um, having to, to face it head-on as an adult now and deal with all that bullshit <laughs> that comes at you and stuff. So definitely, you know, one of those shows that... Um, it's, it's in that sort of corner, um, when you need it to. So I'll say good tier for that. Dateline here, um, compared to most of the other, um, uh, news magazines here, I think it's just okay. Um, it's a little bit better than 48 hours, but it's not as good as, um, 2020 or 60 minutes, I think is like the prime example. The thing I don't like about Dateline is like how much they really milk some of the stories like they're doing the Pam Hub story now because um, the thing about Pam was a show for NBC and then it started as a Dateline story that they adapted into a show 
that they then adapted into a bunch of specials from the show onto Dateline again. So they have just like so many things <laughs> about Pam Up. And they're making a movie about her too. Um, and like the story itself, like I haven't seen the thing about Pam. My mom loves it, but it just seems like not enough substance to warrant a whole mini series, a whole movie, and like two or three two hour specials of Dateline. Like, there's only so much you can talk about with this story, you know what I mean? There's like, she killed her husband. That's all it is. <laughs> or her neighbor, I think. And then she blamed it on her husband. See, that's how little I care. I don't even have the, the story straight. So, yeah, so get Dateline out of here. It's just, it's whatever. Dave, um, on FX, I'm not really that big on Lil Dicky as a rapper. Like most people, I think he is a better actor, actually. And I think... Dave is probably the best thing that he's done. It's better than any album that he's made, if that means anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, FX has had a pretty good string of comedies over the years. I would say dramas are probably they're more like uh, just, you know, that, that's what they're known for more. That's probably what more people associate with them. But their comedy lineup has always been fairly solid. I think Dave is kind of that one that feels a little out of place and just the sense that it should have been a little more edgy than it was. It, it kind of played it safe at times, and that's one of the things that um, it, it, it does get its criticism for. But, I mean, for what it is, it's totally passable by comparison to other shows that attempt to do what it does and just fails miserably. So I'll say good tier for that. Uh, Triple D, Diners, Drives, and Dives talked about it earlier um, as one of the shows that Food Network plays constantly here. Um, it has gotten a little repetitive after a while, so it's kind of between good and great there, but I, I'll stick with good because it's definitely not something I watch as much, you know, nowadays, but it's that very, like, comforting show, you know what I mean? It's like something you can turn on, you know exactly what you're going to get with it. It doesn't pull any punches there. Um, you know, it's very, very reliable, very formulaic, but um, comforting at the same time. So that's a good kind of description of it. Uh, Deadwood here. Not a fan. I tried, you know, I didn't like that pilot episode. I'm sorry. I know a lot of people say you have to stick with it, but I'm not really a crime drama guy and I'm not really a history kind of guy. So that's just one of those things where it's like, that's the key. Those are the key elements to it that it kind of combines. And I just don't think there's a lot there for me personally. So it's just how it is. Uh, Sesame Street. No, excuse me, Sesame Street, though. I mean, that's a show that you have to love. You have to love Sesame Street. Um, it's kind of borderline A1 because, like, obviously legacy-wise. But I'm going to stick with great because as far as, like, if I would watch it nowadays, it probably wouldn't be as relevant to me now as it was back, like, you know, 15 years ago when I was a kid. But, um, yeah, absolutely love it for sure. Um I mean, just so many iconic characters, right? That alone is, like, the big, big uh, aspect with it, for sure. The Muppets and Jim Henson and that whole legacy that uh, he developed over the years that it's still going strong to this day is just absolutely wonderful to see. So, yeah, I mean, who doesn't like Sesame Street, you know? Defending Jacob here. Uh, Chris Evans on this one, and this is Apple TV. I'm going to say good tier. Saw the first couple episodes, thought it was pretty good. Um, didn't really have enough pull to really keep me in, interested in the series, but um, my mom watched it, and she enjoyed it. Um, this was kind of the show that I feel like Apple was, was kind of pushing for because they kind of wanted to delve into this, like, deeper, more mature, you know, crime esque aspect to their dramas there which is kind of the vibe that they've been sticking with since uh they've launched a couple years ago and i think that's a good representation of what they do but it just didn't really have enough substance to really make an impact by comparison to most other dramas uh on competition you know streaming sites and such so decent show but um just didn't really stick out as much as maybe they were hoping for designated survivor I think this is better than 24, but I'm going to put it in the same tier up there at A1 because, um, you know, it's not quite God tier level. It doesn't compare to any of those shows, but um, that was a really, really good show back in the day for sure. Um, another one that kind of was like I watched it and then I got busy and then I didn't keep up with it. And it actually moved to Netflix, so I wasn't even able to watch it after that because, you know, I just sticking with ABC at the time. But 
Yeah, um, this and Quantico, I feel like, were the two ABC shows that they had tremendous success with early on that they should have just stuck with. They should have just kept them going because um, they could have really bounced back as far as like their drama selection goes. Because I've talked about in the past that ABC dramas lineup uh, has been really dry over the past couple of years. I mean, aside from like the Shonda Rhimes stuff like Grey's Anatomy um, is really all they have now that's going strong for them. Um, they should have stuck with a couple of them from like the mid 2010s like that that could have been on like their you know fifth or sixth season by now that um, you know even if they ended they would have gone out with a pretty high mark you know so kind of disappointing to see that but um, you know all things told still a really really excellent show if you've never checked it out Destination Truth man this was a weird era this was a weird era for me man because this was like talking about cryptid and stuff like Bigfoot and Loch Ness and that's what this show is focusing on there were a lot of shows like this around this time and it was such a weird niche because there's only so many things you can say about Bigfoot there's a whole show that we'll talk about later called Finding Bigfoot that was just focused on Bigfoot and every episode they have like 120 episodes of them going into the you know woods in Washington state and hunting for Bigfoot and it's so weird because it's like, how many times can you act like you maybe have a, a, a clue here, like a footprint or a, a hair that might be a Sasquatch, you know? Like, how many times can you ham it up for that? And Destination Truth did do a lot of that, admittedly, but at least they changed what creature they were hunting for each episode. The one thing, though, that I always liked about it was Josh Gates. I mean, Josh Gates is the host so fucking funny he was so personable i mean for that alone i'm going great here because i do have a lot of nostalgia for it as well but um if you didn't already know he doesn't do uh this show anymore this show ended a while ago he does have some other shows on like discovery and stuff they're kind of in that like travel like mystery type of genre there uh they're just not as big but his main claim to fame now is actually on tiktok he does commentaries on game show fails which i know sounds like super niche but he'll literally pull up like those classic like family feud fails or something or like wheel of fortune fails and he'll just make the funniest commentary on him it's so good so fucking hilarious um of course the infamous family feud where it's name three name an animal with three letters in its name and he's just like spouting off a bunch of examples and the guy says alligator <laughs> That might be the funniest one from Family Feud. So, I don't know. I just love that. Um, those little anecdotes, you know, that I find with these shows, I swear. Just so random. But, yeah. Um, overall, a really, really solid show there. Next up, Dexter's Laboratory. Um, another Cartoon Network show. I didn't really watch this one as much growing up. But from what I saw, you know, I'll say good tier there. Um, probably the most interesting uh, example of an episode from this one is Rude Removal, of course. That was Lost Media for a very long time and then was aired on Adult Swim a few years back and people celebrated over that. That was a really great story for the Lost community to community. But yeah, uh, Dexter's Lab, pretty solid Cartoon Network the, uh, show there. And then, of course, we have another Dexter here, Dexter, uh, with Dexter Morgan, Michael C. Hall. I'm going to put that up in the great tier. I really like that pilot episode. That's all I've seen of it so far, so I can't really judge anything afterwards. And I have not seen New Blood either, so I can't judge that. I know that this is going to sound bad, and I have, I'm so sorry in saying this already, but I really don't have that much interest or that much motivation to watch the rest of this show based on what I've seen. Because even though I did like that first episode, like I know how it ends. You know what I mean? And not, like, in the sense that, like, oh, it's just bad. You know, like, the service level, like, you know, I know details about how it ends and how New Blood ends. And, like, knowing that, it's like, why would I justify watching through, you know, nine seasons worth of this show to get to that point you know what i mean especially when it's not going to be satisfying for most people at least i feel like if you were already into dexter when new blood aired then like obviously you were going to watch it but especially now that they they had an opportunity twice and then they fumbled it both times you know for for someone who's never seen the show much after that first episode like myself it's really hard to make that argument to justify why you should put so much time into it you know what i mean 
that's my reasoning behind it, but maybe you disagree. Um, I would love to hear from Dexter fans out there why convince me, try to at least convince me in the comments why I should continue with Dexter, why I should watch through it, knowing how it ends and knowing, you know, the details of it. Uh, next up here, we have Don't Forget the Lyrics. I'm really excited to see this one come back. I think this is going to be a lot of fun here. I'm going to put this in good tier. Um, the version with Wayne Brady was the one that I was uh, familiar with growing up there. Um, a basic, you know, music game show where they'd have you sing like karaoke style and then they would pause and then you have to fill in the rest of the lyrics there from whatever song you picked. Um, really, really interesting, of course, had a lot of different variety in the selections of the genres and such. You had, of course, rock and pop and R&B and country and stuff. So very, very versatile in that, which is great. Anything music related is probably going to be at least a little bit decent for me. So I'm going to put this in the good tier there. Dharma and Greg, man. Chuck Lorre sitcom, super iconic here. Um, I honestly cannot say that I've seen a bad episode of the show um, yet. I mean, I've watched quite a bit of it, and every episode I've seen has been really, really good. Um, I'm not quite to the level of God tier yet, because I haven't seen, you know, all the way through or anything like that. But, um, you know, the, the handful of episodes I have seen, I haven't seen a weak one yet. I have not seen a weak episode in the batch yet. So it has to be at least a one tier. Um, this is another thing that I was going to mention with... Uh, Dharma and Greg here is whenever people say what's the best example of a show that had the most amount of before they were famous appearances in it maybe you say something like Law and Order had quite a bit maybe you say something like Grey's Anatomy had quite a bit my dad would probably argue for NYP Blue he's been watching it recently because we have the full series of it I got him for Christmas and he's been watching it through in like every episode uh, from the first couple seasons has, you know, a familiar face that would go on to do something huge later. For me, it's Dharma and Greg. That's my answer, man. If you take a look at some of the guest stars they had, especially back in the early seasons, before it really took off and before they became huge stars, it's crazy to see the versatility in some of these people. You have everyone from Eric Stone Street on the show who went on to do Modern Family, Jason Bay on the show doing a sitcom, and then he's no most known for... Um, of course, uh, playing Voight on Chicago PD now, which is crazy, going from a uh, comedy, a Chuck Lorre comedy, uh, starting off his career as like a guest star, to now one of the most insane anti-hero crime drama storylines on you know national TV. It's just absolutely wild to see that transition. So there's so many examples of it, but yeah, Darman Greg for me, absolutely A1 tier. Um, terrific show. And another reason why Chuck Lorre is the goat of sitcoms, my friends. Next up is the Dick Van Dyke show here. I'm going to say good tier with Dick Van Dyke. Um, I really like Mary Tyler Moore on the show. I think her self-titled show is better. I have said that previous, uh, you know, in previous videos and such. I do find that one to be uh, held up a little bit better than Dick Van Dyke, but this is still a classic black and white TV. You really can't go wrong with at all. Dinosaur Train, get the fuck out of here. Go, bye-bye. This is probably next to Daniel Tiger's My least favorite of the pbs kids cartoons there um i just i don't know man i just never found dinosaur train to be that entertaining either as like a comedy or educational it just never did anything in either of those camps for me so um i have no reason to promote it high on this list so <laughs> get it out of here you know bottom of the barrel Dish Nation, like I said earlier with Access Hollywood, just, you know, all these tabloid shows are pretty much the same. So going Matt here there. Doctor Who, I haven't seen that much of it. Um, I'm just going to go Matt here with it. The thing with this show, though, that I've mentioned in the past is, like, it feels overwhelming as far as, like, how much stuff out there. Like, I'm a Law & Order fan, and that's probably the, the closest analogy I can make to it as far as, like, if you weren't already familiar with it, how to get into it, how to like, you know, become a part of that fandom. I have no idea where to start with Doctor Who. There is just so much media out there, so much of the TV, there's movies, there's specials, there's all sorts of stuff out there. And there's just so much content. Um, a lot of it's missing too. Uh, that's a very infamous, another example of lost media uh, in the TV world is with Doctor Who. A lot of those early episodes from like the 60s and 70s are just completely gone now, which is crazy. So 
Um, I think there was like over 150 of them or something like that are just missing now, which is insane. So, but yeah, um, I respect the Doctor Who community because it's absolutely massive, but I just have no no idea where to start if I wanted to get into it. And then the bits and pieces I've seen have just been okay for me. Uh, Dollface here. I really was disappointed by this one, man. I mean, this is borderline bottom of the barrel. I'm not going to put it down there because obviously I love Kat Dennings here from Two Broke Girls and WandaVision, but yikes, this was her, this is another show that she did after Two Broke Girls, and this was on Hulu. It had that sort of like avant-garde experimental style. It almost reminded me of New World to some degree as far as like the story, but um, the presentation of it was so out there and so like, just surreal, you know, almost like David Lynch-esque, you know, psychedelic style. I mean, it was really, really weird. Um, and it just non-linear at all, just extremely like, you know, the, the whole existence of the show was very much like an anecdote for, you know, something bigger that I was trying to promote. It was like not, not just like a very basic story at all. So I don't know, hard to describe unless you've seen it yourself. It's really out there. Um, was not funny either, so terrible show. Uh, arguably worse though, <laughs> we have Domino Masters. God damn it, dude. I fucking hate Domino Masters so much. I talked about this in a previous video, but dude, I just don't get, I mean, what a head scratcher. Like, I just don't understand why they have Eric Stone Street hosting this and why Danica McKellar from the Wonder Years is one of the judges here. I just don't get it. Like, dude, I love the Wonder Years, man. I mean, that's Winnie Cooper, right? Like, w what has she done that she needs this money, bro? Is she in a bad drug deal or something? I mean, is she in gambling debt or something? Like, dude, we need to set up a PayPal for her because that's just embarrassing, man, that she's taking this. And that's what I said in my, uh, in like when I was talking about it in a previous video was like, I have to assume that to some degree that these people want to do these types of shows when they have like these weird hosting gigs or these judging gigs, especially when you're on a very successful show like that beforehand where you're getting royalties and such and you can just kind of coast off of what you've done in the past. And The Wonder is very profitable, very, very lucrative show, even still to this day. I'm sure that to some degree they have a, a bid with the new one that they probably get a cut of it or they probably get royalties from it for like a story credit or something like that. So it all just funnels back. So I'm sure that she doesn't need it to like remain stable, you know, as far as like a paycheck goes. I'm sure it's something that she wanted to do, which is even more confusing because the show itself sucks, you know? I mean, it's just so bad. So the only person that is qualified to do this is Lily Havish. She's the only person that should be part of this show. It should be her show. It should be a YouTube original. It should not be on Fox. It should not be hosted by Eric Stones. <sighs> what a fucking disaster of a show. Get the fuck out of here, man. Fuck Domino Masters. That's bullshit. Um, next up is Don't Hear, hosted by Adam Scott. I'm going to put this in bottom of the barrel um, because this, the only recollection I have of this is just like one of the worst nights I've ever had, you know, when this was on, which I'm not going to go into detail for, for personal reasons, but yeah, that night sucked. So, and the only thing I want is don't. So, yeah, fuck that. Uh, Door of the Explorer. I'm going to put this in, I'm going to put this in bad tier. I mean, it's not like, I guess it's not like the worst show ever, but it's just so dumb, you know, it's just so stupid. The funniest thing that Dora, like that, that, the funniest door related thing out there or media is this college humor sketch they did with Ariel Winter from Modern Family as Dora was fucking hilarious. Like I didn't see the Dora movies or anything, but like I just can't imagine that like there's that many people that really want to see Dora related shit in 2022. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's just so fucking stupid. I'm sorry. It's just so dumb. Uh, Double Dare a game show from the 70s there, hosted by Alex Trebek, not to be confused with Double Dare from the 90s, from Nickelodeon with Mark Summers, but completely different style of show. Um, I'll put this in the good tier. I mean, Alex Trebek, rest in peace, man, a legendary game show host. He did a lot of stuff before and during Jeopardy, too, during his tenure on Jeopardy. Um, so super, super influential on that. 
But um, it's another one that, like, I think most people, like Child's Play I was talking about earlier, probably just don't really remember all that much. And it's for a reason, because it's just not the most interesting idea for a show. Um, but, you know, it, it is what it is, I guess. <laughs> what you see is what you get there. Downton Abbey. Um, between Meg and Good, but I'll put it in Meg, because it's definitely not something that I probably would have watched if not for just the project that I was doing where it was like, you know, a requirement that I had because it was part of our drama tournament. Um, but if not for that, I probably wouldn't have ever seen the show to begin with. So not, not much interest in watching past that either. Uh, Dr. Roz, morally, I mean, he goes in bad tier. Dr. Phil, morally, he goes in bad tier, but he's a little more watchable at least. So I'll put him in that. Uh, Dragon Tales, that's a classic PBS show there. Um, I'll go good tier, you know. It's definitely not like, I didn't watch it as much as pretty much any other uh, PBS kids show on this list. I mean, that's probably like the lowest amount that I saw for any of them growing up. But um, from what I remember, from what I can recollect is pretty okay. Uh, Dragon's Den, Canadian Shark Tank. Not as good as the real Shark Tank because... You know, I'm a dumb American, right? So I think patriotically, the America is number one, and all of it is a rip-off, even though Dragon's Den came first, technically. Um, Kevin and Robert from Shark Tank also appear on this show because they are both Canadian. Um, and I guess they were, like, the most popular, so that's why they brought them over to the real Shark Tank when that was popping off. Um, but it's fine, you know? I mean, if you like Shark Tank, you're probably going to enjoy it to some degree. I like Shark Tank. Um, so I like it a little bit, but it's not the same, you know, exact thing. It's, it's presented a little differently. I can definitely say that like some of the products they get on this one are a little bit more trivial or a little wacky or, you know, silly things because, um, you know, it, it's not as like focused in on like, oh, you're doing this for the American dream and you're doing it for your family. You know, you're just doing it to be on that show, right, more or less. So that's uh, that's Dragon's Den for you. Drew Carey's Improvaganza. Fuck Drew Carey. Get him the fuck out of here, dude. I fucking hate Drew Carey so much. Like, I hate the Drew Carey show. But more than that, this thing is just so bad because it's the worst parts of Who's Line, which is great, and the Drew Carey show, which sucks. If you're making something that sucks even worse and you're making something that's great, awful which is terrible on all levels and like improv in general is just so eh, you know it, it's just it's fine i guess but there's nothing sustainable about it you know it's something you watch on like youtube and like a three minute video the thought of sitting down and watching a 45 minute episode of Drew carey doing improv no hard pass down the rabbit hole, uh, Frederick Nensen on YouTube doing this one. Love it. Love it. Um, super informative. I mean, super, super informative. Like, uh, incredibly mature, incredibly intelligent the way it's presented here. Um, there's literally, like, some episodes that are, like, four hours long. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Um, so, yeah, absolutely great stuff. Duncanville here. I'm going Matt here, honestly. Um, I talked a lot about this in the pilot project. It's okay as far as for Fox and for their animation stuff, it's, you know, kind of below average, if anything else. But the cast is great, so, you know, can't hate on it too much for that. Eastbound and Down, um, kind of between good and mad, or I'm um, not good and mad, good and great. Um, you know, I haven't seen it as much of it, so I'll put it in the good tier. But, yeah, um, pretty solid. I mean, um... Danny McBride is, you know, a great fit for this type of character, Kenny Powers, and, um, of course, uh, Kane Mixon as well as the love interest on there, April, is also pretty solid. For HBO, it feels a little more, like, crass, and it's a little cruder than most of their other comedies, which is quite nice, because it's a little more refreshing for them, but, like, in the grand scheme of things as well, it feels a little under, you know, under par for HBO because you you know you expect them to hit a really high level a really high bar doesn't really have that same like um 
you know, maturity to it as like a Veep or something like that. But um, still, you know, not too bad of a show. Uh, next up, Banshee here. This is actually a newer edition. Probably, uh, this might be the most recent show that I've seen um, from any of these on this tier list here. I just saw the pilot not too long ago, maybe about a month ago, off of Mike's recommendation. He recently finished it. I'm going to go great tier. Um, I really, really loved that pilot episode. I thought that was really, really interesting. It's definitely, you know, a crime drama first, and you guys know how I feel about those. So a little more hit or miss in that. But um, I think the leads are good. I think the basic premise of him kind of taking over for this, you know, sheriff that's going to be in town. Um, you know, the first scene is he gets out of jail and you kind of start to learn a little bit about his past life, that he has some vices and stuff that he's trying to get away from. And then he ends up becoming the sheriff of this town because of, um, you know, incident that happens. I won't spoil it, but, um, you know, something that happens that's pretty pivotal in the first episode there. Um, so it's that dichotomy between like him being like an ex-con and then him trying to do, you know, right his own wrongs and, and kind of protect everybody else in this show is really where a lot of the emotion comes from with it. So I could see, you know, how this is very, very, um, interesting because it's a little more uniquely presented than most typical crime dramas. So yeah, uh, I'll put it in the great tier for sure. Uh, next up is Alan here. I mean, no, 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 no. Alan's game of games. No, 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 no. Get him out of here. Fuck that. Um, emergency call. Um, this is a show that Steph really wanted to see because she really likes these like, um, really know what you call these, like what genre this goes into. I guess it's like first responder-esque type drama, but um, this is unscripted. So it's, um, you know, it follows the lives of these 911 operators. You get to see like this documentary style firsthand, what it's like to be a 911 operator and kind of what that uh, you know, lifestyle is like. And, you know, reenacting these, um, you know, real life calls that are taking place there. And it's pretty good at like, because most of these, you know, documentary type shows are always going to ham it up in some way and kind of make it a little more Hollywood, right? Make it better for TV. This feels like really down to earth and genuine because the situations that these people are in are, you know, life and death. So it really is like dramatic in that way. And you really feel for it. Um, my one big criticism with the show though is Luke Wilson has absolutely no purpose here. He's kind of like the host of it. I guess you could say he, he kind of just like introduces the segments and is kind of like, you know, they'll, they'll give him like the bridge between each of the calls or whatever, um, in between the commercials and stuff. But it's just, it's so weird because he doesn't offer anything like insightful to say. <laughs> it's just like the most vanilla commentary you could come up with. And like Luke Wilson's fine. I don't have anything against him. It's just, I don't know, such a weird inclusion for these shows again. You know, it's just it's so fucking weird. But anyways, yeah, it's a it's a decent show. Amp Lemon is a terrific show, though. Not just a terrific show, arguably a perfect show. I'm not even exaggerating here because boy, oh boy, did we find another God tier level show, my friends. Yes. Emplemon on um, YouTuber here does these super insightful videos and super intelligent, mature, like commentaries on a whole bunch of different topics. He does a ton of TV topics, which is great. He has a bunch of TV topics. He has a series called uh, Never Ever where he talks about like one specific item or specific thing in a particular category and why there will never ever be something like that again in that category so for example like um spongebob was the first episode so there will never ever be another cartoon like spongebob because it had such a you know impact on animation and the way that um animated tv shows look and feel nowadays and there will never be a show like that ever again you know there will never be another simpsons episode like homer's enemy right probably the most famous episode of that show um and so just does these really insightful you know documentary style shows as well um but what's crazy is like the way it's presented because his his speech is super high class and his vocabulary is great and it just comes off like extremely intelligent and profound for a topic as trivial as the fruit of the loom logo <laughs> you know what i mean he does like these like extremely niche topics 
Um, his most recent video is about New Coke, you know, and it's a half hour documentary on New Coke. And it's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy how this man does it. So yeah, absolutely top tier. I mean, uh, e easily, easily the best commentary, like documentary YouTuber out there, like hands down, man, absolutely fantastic stuff. Uh, equals three here. Speaking of YouTube, uh, equals three. I'm going to say good tier for equals three. I mean, definitely not where it once was. They don't even make them anymore. Um, and the last like year and a half or so without where he was, was rough for sure. They just kind of rotated out a bunch of hosts. Um, none of them really hit the same way as uh, Ray William Johnson, of course. Ray William Johnson himself is still going strong. He does a lot of YouTube shorts now. He does TikTok, and he's having major success with that. So I wish him the best ever, because I always liked him and his personality. But um, the show itself was super of its time. Like, there was a reason why it had to end at some point, because there was no way it was going to be sustainable nowadays. I mean, the idea of, like, these short, viral, you know, little fail videos like you saw when it started that genre just doesn't really exist that much anymore. It's all about like these long form essays like we were just talking about with Ned Lemon. So um, it had to come to an end just naturally because the culture just changed over time. But in its heyday, it was justifiably one of the best things on YouTube for sure. How We Roll, uh, the new series on CBS there about um, Tom Smallwood, Pro Bowler, that tier so fucking stupid so forgettable um i mean <laughs> it's just i guess the idea behind it is okay like kind of doing this biopic sitcom sort of thing about this professional bowler but just the way it's executed is so bland and so milk toast and so vanilla no reason for it to exist erb epic rap battles um i'm going god tier with erb i mean you can call them cheesy. You can say that it's kind of over the top. And like some people might argue they weren't as good as they once were. I totally disagree. I think even the newer seasons, the newer episodes are just as good as they once were um, from back in like 2010 when they started. But yeah, infinitely rewatchable, like totally rewatchable. I mean, there are people that are just making videos in 2022 almost uh what 15 years or so 12 15 years after it started ranking every single battle every single video in the series uh because that's how much of a fan base and dedicated uh, audience it has still all this time later so absolutely god tier for sure er all right so very important thing that i wanted to address with er going forward here you guys know I'm not really that big on medical dramas at all, but ER is part of the elusive five that I think are actually worthy of being considered really top great medical shows out there, all in the great tier. There's no medical show that's going to be above the great tier because it's just not that good. But ER, and I forgot to mention Chicago Med as well, are part of the elusive five that do belong in the great tier, that are the only five medical shows in the history of TV that deserve that spot. The other three will come later, but everything else in this genre is pretty much just absolutely garbage and borderline bottom of the barrel because there are so many out there. In the grand scheme of things, there's probably been like well over a hundred, you know, decent or, you know, well-known medical shows out there. There's only five of them that I think are worth preserving. Everything else can go and uh, everything else is dog shit. There you go. E.T., um, another one of these uh, tabloid shows, so just kind of meh. Sean in the Wild, uh, first we feast show with uh, Sean Evans as the host. I'll put it in good tier. Um, you know, it's all right. It's not something that, like, I'm going to sit and watch everything for. It's just kind of mediocre uh, as far as, like, the structure goes you know it's it kind of has that like, travel style to it a little bit um where they're going around and trying different foods and whatnot and he has some guests on but um i don't know it, it's really not something that you can it, like there's nothing exclusive about it that makes it a must watch you know this it's a very simple premise that you can find pretty much anywhere else that's done just as good if not better than it is here 
Uh, next up here, Everybody Hates Chris, of course. This is a very topical show, um, given Chris Rock and, you know, him and Will Smith, of course, the incident that happened. But um, even still, I mean, even outside of that, like, this was a great show, man. This was such a fantastic show um, back in the day. It was very much a product of its time, very much something that feels a little dated, maybe hasn't aged all perfectly, you know, definitely some instances there. Um, that maybe are a little bit more problematic nowadays, but um, still, I mean, great, great sense of humor there. Chris Rock is just great in general. Um, and then, of course, Terry Crews here and Rochelle, um, the mom on the show, is fucking hilarious. Uh, the actress that plays her is on The Neighborhood now. And then, of course, Tyler James Williams on Abbott Elementary, like to see his growth there, um, playing the title character Chris on the show and then going into what he does now is phenomenal um i mean everybody in the cast is so so good on it so uh, yeah definitely one of the best on here everybody loves raymond you already know you already know get it out of here fuck that show absolutely garbage uh extra here another one of these tabloid shows extreme couponing i'm gonna say good tier um a little bit of a guilty pleasure it's dumb in the sense that like it's so unrealistic you know what i mean to like stockpile these coupons and save six hundred dollars you know on a six hundred dollar pay you know 30 cents or whatever the fuck it is like it, it's kind of crazy but it is pretty impressive it's pretty interesting to watch i mean for a tlc show i'd much rather watch this than like my 600 pound life or like um what are the other ones like i was gonna say intervention i think that's i don't think that's on tlc though but um, yeah, I'd like much rather watch this because it's, at least it's not like, you know, a bunch of fat people trying to walk around and shit. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, so I'll give you that. Uh, Alex Myers here, another YouTuber that does uh, TV commentaries. I'm gonna put him in good tier. Um, there was a period where I was like really, really big on him, but he's kind of stepped down a little bit for me. Um, he talks mostly about like Disney Channel and Nickelodeon shows, so does like some retrospective kind of comedy videos on those, which are pretty funny. Um, but he also does a lot of like recent, like he does, he does like the CW shows like Riverdale and like teen dramas like that, which I don't usually watch those because I'm not that familiar with those shows, but definitely the like Disney Channel, Nickelodeon stuff are pretty fun to see um, his commentary on. So um, yeah, pretty solid overall. And I think we're going to wrap up this uh, part of this video. We're coming up close to an hour and a half here. So we'll end this part with Family Feud here. A very, very strong one to end on because this is yet going to be another show that goes way up at the top in the God tier level. Um, yeah, absolutely fantastic. I mean, we watch Family Feud pretty much every day, uh, me and Matt. Uh, absolutely love it. Um, whether it's the uh, older episodes with, of course, Richard Dawson as the OG host of it way back in the 70s, and then the modern day version with Steve Harvey, of course, is iconic as well, uh, everybody in between. But this is the prime example of a game show that hits both elements perfectly well, where you have the contestants are very you know, lively and fun, and they're obviously having a great time being on the show, but then it's great to play along with uh, when you're watching it, and it translates super well to like a board game or a, ver a video game version of it um, that me and my family play all the time, of course, and uh, having those board game versions of classic game shows is a staple for sure, um, and seeing how they translate to one and Family Feud is probably the best example of, you know, a game show that's successful in doing so. So there you have it. That is going to be the final show for this part here. Um, let me know what you thought of my ranking so far. Still, even after two whole videos, we still have a ton more to go. This is probably going to be just an ongoing series on the channel. Um, I don't even know how long it's going to take here, but we definitely have a lot more to cover here. So stay tuned. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you for watching.